Hello there. Last time around, we read chapter 14, Mamsil Marie. Now we're going to read chapter 15, The Paths of Life, in Selma Lagerlöf's book, The Saga of Joste Berling. Yeah, there must be a picture of Joste Berling there on the cover in traditional 18th, early 18th century dress. Here we go. Chapter 15, The Paths of Life. Toilsome are the pathways that people must wander on this earth. Desert paths, marsh paths, mountain paths. Why does so much sorrow go undisturbed until it gets lost in the desert or sinks into the marsh or falls on the mountain? Where are the little flower? Where are the little flower gatherers? Where are the little fairy tale princesses out of whose tracks roses grow? Where are they? Who should strew flowers across the toilsome ways. Now Joste Berling, the poet, has decided to marry. He is only seeking a bride who is poor enough, lowly enough, rejected enough for an insane minister. Beautiful and noble women have loved him, but they may not come forward to compete for his hand. The disowned one chooses among the disowned. Who should he choose? Who should he seek out? Sometimes a poor girl comes to Acabe from a deserted forest village far up in the hills and sells brooms. In this village where constant poverty and great misery prevail, there are many who do not have full possession of their mental faculties, and the girl with the brooms is one of them. But she is beautiful. Her ample black hair forms such thick braids that they scarcely fit on her head. Her cheeks are finely rounded, her nose straight and properly proportioned, her eyes blue. She has a melancholy Madonna-like type of beauty, such as you still find in beautiful girls on the shores of Leuven's Long Lake. Well, there of course, Gösta has found his fiancée. A half-crazy broom girl will be a good wife for an insane minister. Nothing would be more suitable. He only needs to travel to Karlstad for the rings, and then they may once again have a joyful day on the shore of Leuven. They may laugh at Joste Berling once again when he gets engaged to the broom girl, when he celebrates the wedding with her. Let them laugh. Has he ever come up with a more comical prank? Must not the disowned go the way of the disowned, the way of wrath, the way, the way of sorrow? the way of misfortune. What does it matter if he falls and if he is ruined? Is there anyone who cares to stop him? Is there anyone who extends him a supporting hand or a refreshing drink? Where are the little flower gatherers? Where are the little fairy tale princesses? Where are they who should strew roses across toilsome ways? No, no, the young gentle countess at Borg must not disturb Joste Berling in his plans. She must think about her reputation. She must think about her husband's anger and her mother-in-law's hatred. She must not do anything to hold him back. During the long church service in Svartra Church, she will bow her head, clasp her hands, and pray for him. During sleepless nights, she may weep and worry about him, but she has no flowers to strew on the path of the disowned, no drop of water to give him who thirsts. She does not reach out her hand to pull him back from the edge of the abyss. Joste Berling does not care to wrap his chosen one in silk and jewelry. He lets her go from farm to farm with brooms, as is her habit. But when he has gathered all the excellent men and women of the region at the bank, great banquet at Acabe, he will announce his engagement. Then he will call her in from the kitchen, as she has arrived from her long wanderings, with the dust and dirt of the road on her clothes, perhaps ragged, perhaps uncombed, with confused eyes, with the confused flow of words on her lips. And he will ask the guests if he hasn't chosen a suitable bride. If the insane minister shouldn't be proud of such a lovely fiancé, of this gentle Madonna face, of these blue, dreamy eyes. It was his intention that no one should know anything ahead of time, 
but he did not succeed in keeping the secret. And one of those who found out was the young Countess Dona. But what could she do to stop him? The engagement day is near. Its late twilight hour has arrived. The Countess stands at the window in the blue study and looks northward. She almost believes that she can see Acopy, although tears and mist obscure it. She sees so well how the large three-story house radiates with three illuminated rows of windows. She imagines how the champagne is being poured into the glasses, how the toasts resound, and how Gusta Berling announces his engagement to the broom girl. What if she were near him now and very slowly placed her hand on his arm or simply gave him a friendly glance? Would he not then turn away from the wicked way of the disowned? If a word from her has driven him to such a desperate action, would not a word from her then stop him? She shudders at the sin that he will commit against this poor, unfortunate child. She shudders at his sin against the poor being who will now be enticed into loving him, perhaps simply for a one-day joke, perhaps two, and then she shudders even more at the sin he commits against himself in order to be chained fast to his life like an oppressive burden and for all time take from his spirit the power to reach the heights. And ultimately the guilt was hers. She had thrown him out and onto the wicked way with a word of condemnation. She who had come to bless, to alleviate. Why had she twisted yet another spike in the sinner's crown of thorns? Yes, now she knows what she will do. She will have the black horses harnessed to the sleigh. Hurry across Leuven, storm into the Acabe estate, place herself before Gerste Berling and tell him that she does not despise him, that she did not know what she was saying when she chased him away from her home. No, she, could, she still could not do any such thing. She would be ashamed and dare not say a word. She who was married must be careful. There would be so much slander if she did such a thing. But if she didn't do it, what would happen to him? She had to go. Then she thinks that such a journey is impossible. This year no more horses can travel across the ice of Leuven. The ice is melting. It has already come apart from land. The ice lies loose, cracked, terrible to see. Water purls up and down through it. In some places, water has collected in black pools. In other places, the ice is blinding white. For the most part it is gray, however, dirty from melting snow, and the pathways go like long black strips across its surface. How can she think about going? Old Countess Merta, her mother-in-law, would never allow such a thing. She had to sit next to her the whole evening in the drawing room and listen to those old court stories, which are the old woman's amusement. Yet the night is coming, and her husband is away. Now she is free. She cannot drive. She dares not call the servants, but her anxiety drives her out of her home. She can do nothing else. Toilsome are the pathways people wander on the earth. Desert paths, marsh paths, mountain paths. But this nighttime pathway across melting ice, what should I compare it to? It is not the pathway that the little flower gatherers themselves must go, an uncertain, tottering, slippery way the way of those who wish to heal inflicted wounds, the way of those who wish to set things right, the way of the light foot, the quick eye, the brave loving heart. It was past midnight when the countess reached the shore of Acabe. She had fallen on the ice. She had jumped across wide fissures. She had hurried across the places where her footsteps were filled with purling water. She had slipped and she had crawled. It had been a toilsome journey. She had wept as she went. She was wet and tired, and out there on the ice in the darkness, desolation and emptiness had given rise to gruesome thoughts. Now finally at Acabe she had to wait, wade in foot-deep water in order to reach land. And when she had come onto the shore, she had no courage for anything other than sitting down on a stone and weeping from fatigue and helplessness. 
Toilsome ways walk the children of humankind, and the little flower gatherers collapse at times, next to their baskets, just when they have caught up to the person's path they want to strew with flowers. This young noble lady was, however, a charming little heroine. She had not walked such pathways in her bright homeland. Well might she sit at the edge of this horrible, dreadful lake, wet, tired, unhappy as she is, and think about the gentle flower-edged paths of her southern fatherland. For her it is no longer a question of south and north. She stands in the midst of life. She is not crying from homesickness. She is crying, this little flower gatherer, this little heroine, because she is so tired that she will not catch up to the person's pathway that she wants to strew with flowers. She cries because she believes that she has come too late. Then people come running along the shore. They hurry past her without seeing her, but she hears their words. If the dam collapses, then the smithy will go, says one, and the mill and the workshops and the blacksmith's houses, another fills in. Then she gets up new courage and follows them. Akeby Mill and Smithy were on a narrow point around which the Björkfer River roared. It came rushing down towards the point, whipped white in the massive falls above, and at that time a massive breakwater was in front of the point to protect the built-up ground from the water. But the dam had gotten old, and the cavaliers were in charge. In their time, the dance went over the hills at the ironworks. But no one took the time to see how the current and cold and time were working on the old stone dam. Then comes along the spring flood, and the dam starts to give way. The fall at Akeby is a mighty granite stair down which the waves of the Björkfra River come rushing. They become dizzy with the speed, tumbling end over end and spraying foam over one another, again tumbling down over a stone, over a log, and then up again to fall again and again and again, foaming, hissing, roaring, and now these wild and flamed waves, intoxicated by the spring air, dizzy with their newfound freedom, start to storm the old stone wall. They come hissing and tearing, storm high up on it, and then pull back as if they had struck their white locked heads. This is a storming as good as any. They take great pieces of ice as shelter, they take logs as battering rams. They pry, break, roar against this poor wall until suddenly it seems as if someone had called them to attention. Then they rush backward, and after them a large stone comes loose from the dam and sinks with a crash down into the stream. It appears as if this surprised them. They stand still, they rejoice, they take counsel, and then they set about anew. There they are again with ice chunks and logs, mischievous, unmerciful, wild, crazy with the lust to destroy. If only the dam were gone, say the waves, if only the dam were gone, then it would be the smithy's turn and the mill's turn. Now is the day of freedom, away with people and the works of people. They have sooted us with coal, they have dusted us with flour, they have put yokes on us like oxen, driven us in a ring, closed us in, impeded us with locks, forced us to pull the heavy wheels, carry the ungainly logs. But now we will win our freedom. The day of freedom has come. Hear that, waves up in Bjork Lake. Hear that, brothers and sisters in bog and marsh, in mountain brook and forest stream. Come, come, rush down to the Bjork River. Come with fresh forces booming, hissing, ready to break the centuries-old oppression. Come, the bulwark of tyranny must fall, death to Achebe. And they come, wave after wave, rushes down the falls to drive its head against the dam wall, to lend its help to the great work, intoxicated by spring's newfound freedom, numerous, untied, sorry, numerous, united, they come and loosen stone upon stone, tuft upon tuft, from the tottering breakwater. 
But why then do the people let the wild waves rage without putting up any resistance? Is Achaby deserted? No, there are people there, a confused, perplexed, helpless group of people. Dark as the night, they do not see one another, do not see their own way. High up the falls roar. The boom of breaking ice and crashing logs is dreadful. They do not hear their own voices. The wild dizziness that ensouls the roaring waves fills the brains of the people as well. They do not have a thought left. No reason. The ironworks bell is clanging. May anyone who has ears hear. We down here at Akeby Smithy are about to disappear. The river is upon us. The dam is quaking. The smithy is in danger. The mill is in danger. And our own poor houses, beloved in their insignificance, are in danger. The waves may believe that the bell ringing is calling their friends, for no person appears. But off in forests and marshes there is urgency. Send helpers, send helpers, rings the bell. After centuries long slavery, we have finally set ourselves free. Come, come, roar the waves. The booming water mass and the clanging ironworks bell sing a death song over all the glory and luster of Achaby. And in time, message after message goes up to the estate for the cavaliers. Are they in a mood to think about smithy and mill? The hundred guests are gathered in the expansive halls of Achaby. The broom girl is waiting out in the kitchen. The exciting moment of surprise has come. The champagne sparkles in the glasses. Julius rises to give the banquet speech. All the old adventurers at Achaby are pleased by the petrifying astonishment that will settle over the assembly. Out on the ice of Leuven, the young Countess Dona walks a dreadful dangerous path to whisper a word of warning to Jöste Berling. Down at the waterfall, the waves are making an assault against all the glory and power of Achaby. But in the expansive halls, only joy and eager expectation prevail. The wax candles radiate and the wine is flowing. No one there is thinking about what is moving about in the dark, stormy spring night. Just now the moment has arrived. Yosta gets up and goes out to bring in the fiancé. He has to go through the vestibule and its great doors stand wide open. He stops, he looks out into the coal black night, and he hears, he hears, he hears the bell clang and the rapids roar, he hears the boom of the breaking ice, the din of crashing logs, the roaring, mocking, victory, rejoicing, freedom song of the rebellious waves. Then he rushes out into the night, forgetting everything, let them stand in there with raised glasses and wait until the world's final day. He no longer cares about them. The fiancé can wait. Squire Julius's speech can die on his lips. The rings will not be exchanged this night. The petrifying astonishment will not settle over the brilliant assembly. Now, woe to you, rebellious waves. Now, in truth, this will be a fight for your freedom. Now Jöste Berling has come down to the falls. Now the people have a commander. Now courage is lit in terrified hearts. Now the defenders climb up onto the walls. And now a mighty battle begins. Hear how he calls to the people. He gives orders. He puts everyone into action. We must have light, light above all. The miller's horn lantern won't suffice here. Look at those piles of twigs. Carry them up on the slope and light them. That's a job for women and children. Just do it quickly. Make a big flaming bonfire and light it. It will light up our labor. It will be seen far and wide and summon helpers here. And never let it go out. Bring straw. Bring twigs. Let bright flames flare against the sky. Look, look, you grown-up men. Here is work for you. Here is lumber. Here are planks. Put together an emergency dam that we can lower down in front of the failing wall. Hurry, hurry to work. Do it solid and steady. Arrange stones and sandbags to lower down too. Quick, swing your axes. Let the hammer strokes thunder. Let the drill bite into the wood and saw screech 
in the dry planks. And where are the boys? Onward, onward, you wild good-for-nothings. Get poles, get boat hooks, and come here into the thick of battle. Go out onto the dam with you, lads, in the midst of the waves that are foaming, hissing, and spraying over us with white foam. Fend off, weaken, repel those attacks that are cracking the walls. Push aside logs and chunks of ice. Throw yourselves down if nothing else helps, and hold tight to the loosening stones with your hands. Bite into them. Hold on to them with claws of iron. Fight, boys, good-for-nothings, wild brains, out onto the wall with you. We will fight for every inch of ground. Yerste himself takes his place at the farthest end of the dam and stands there, sprayed with foam, the ground quaking beneath him, the waves thundering and raging, but his wild heart delights in the danger, the commotion, the battle. He laughs. He has merry quips for the boys on the dam around him. He was never part of a more amusing night. The rescue work goes quickly indeed. The fires flare, the lumbermen's axes boom, and the dam stands. The other cavaliers and the hundred guests have also come down to the waterfall. People come running from far and near. <clears throat> All are working at the fires, at the emergency dam, with the sandbags out on the failing, shaking stone dam. So now the carpenters have the emergency dam ready. Now it will be lowered in front of the tottering breakwater. Keep stones and sandbags, sandbags ready and boat hooks and rope so that it isn't pulled away so that the victory may be the people's and the suppressed waves go back to slave service. Then it happens, right before the decisive moment that Gersta catches sight of a woman sitting on a stone by the river shore. The flames from the bonfire illuminate her where she sits staring out onto the waves. Of course, he cannot see her clearly through the smoke and foam, but his eyes are unceasingly drawn to her. He feels as if this woman had some business with him, with him in particular. Among all of these hundreds who are working and busy on the river's edge, she is the only one who is sitting still, and his glances turn to her incessantly. He sees no one other than her. She is sitting so far out that the waves strike against her feet. The foam sprays over her. She must be dripping wet, she is dark clothed with a black shawl over her head. She is sitting hunched up, supporting her chin with her hands and staring unceasingly at him out on the breakwater. He feels how those staring eyes draw and entice, although he cannot even make out her face. He thinks of nothing other than the woman who is sitting at the edge of the white waves. It is the sea witch from Leuven who has come up into the river to lure me to destruction, he thinks. She is sitting there and luring and luring. I have to chase her away. All these waves with their white heads appear to him like the armies of the black woman. She was the one who incited them. She who led them forth against him in attack. I truly must chase her away, he says. He grasps a boat hook, leaps ashore, and hurries over to the woman. He leaves his place on the breakwater's outermost tip in order to chase away the sea witch. In this moment of agitation, to him, it is as if the evil forces of the deep are fighting with him. He does not know what he thinks, what he believes, but he must chase away the black woman from the stone at the river's edge. O oh, Yerste, why does your place stand empty at the decisive moment? They are coming now with the emergency dam. A long row of fellows are lining up on the breakwater. They have rope and stones and sandbags ready to weigh it down and keep it in place. They stand ready. They wait. They listen. Where is the commander? Is the voice that will order and organize not heard? No. Jöste Berling is chasing away the sea witch. His voice is not heard. His commands lead no one. Then the emergency dam must be lowered without him. The waves step aside. It plunges down into the depths and after its stones and sandbags. 
But how is the work carried out without the leader? No caution, no orderliness. The waves rush forth anew. They break with renewed fury against these new obstacles. They start rolling aside the sandbags and tearing the ropes, loosening the stones, and they succeed. They succeed, mocking, rejoicing. They lift the whole wall on strong shoulders, pull and tear at it, and then they have it in their power. Away with this miserable bulwark, down into Leuven with it, and then onward again against the tottering, helpless stone dam. But Gerste Berling is chasing after the sea witch. She sees him, and he is coming toward her, swinging the boat hook. She becomes afraid. It appears as if she intends to rush out into the water, but she changes her mind and runs towards land. Sea witch, calls Gerste, swinging the boat hook after her. She hurries in among the alder shrubs, gets entangled in the dense branches, and remains standing. Then Gerste throws away the boat hook, goes over, and places her hand, his hand on her shoulder. You are out late tonight, Countess Elizabeth, he says. Let me be, Mr. Berling. Let me go home. He obeys at once and turns away from her. But because she is not only a noble lady, but actually a kind little woman who cannot bear the thought that she has brought someone to despair, because she is a little flower gatherer who always has roses enough in her basket to adorn the most desolate pathway, she regrets it at once, goes after him, and takes his hand. I came, she says, stammering. I came because... Oh, Mr. Berling, you haven't done it, have you? Say that you haven't done it. I was so afraid when you came running after me, but it was just you I wanted to see. I wanted to ask you that you shouldn't think about what I'd last said and that you could come home as usual. How did you get here, Countess? She is laughing nervously. I guess I knew that I would come too late, but I did not want to tell anyone that I had gone. And besides, you understand, you can't drive across the lake any longer. Have you walked across the lake, Countess? Yes, of course. But, Mr. Berling, tell me now, are you engaged? You understand, I wanted so badly that you weren't. It is so wrong, you see, and it felt as if I were guilty of the whole thing. You should not have paid so much attention to a word from me. I am a stranger who does not know the customs of this land. It is so empty at Borg since you don't come there any more, Mr. Berling. It seems to Gerste Berling, as he stands among the wet alder bushes on the marshy ground, as if someone is throwing an entire armful of roses over him. He is wading in roses all the way up to his knees. They shine before his eyes out of the darkness. He greedily drinks in their fragrance. Have you done it? she repeats. He has to resolve to answer her and put an end to her anxiety, although he feels such a great delight over it. No, he gets so warm inside and so light as he thinks about what a pathway she has wandered, how wet she is, how chilled, how anxious she must be, how cried out her voice sounds. No, he says, I am not engaged. Then she once again seizes his hand and caresses it. I am so happy. I am so happy, she says. And her breast, which has been constricted by anxiety, is shaking with sobs. Then there are flowers enough on the poet's path. All that is dark, evil, and hateful melts away from his heart. How good you 